Hey guys, it's Libby and today I'm doing my second warm-up video for the Bard Book Club. Um, you can already check out my video on Shakespeare and genre. Today we're talking about Shakespeare and verse. So how does Shakespeare use the structure of words and syllables to create additional meaning? This video is going to come in two parts. The first part is a basic introduction to verse in English poetry. So if you're already familiar with this sort of stuff and you want to move on to how it is used specifically in Shakespeare, go to this time. Now, since I am talking specifically about verse in the English language, I'm going to be re referring to stressed and unstressed syllables, as opposed to the long and short syllables that you would find in Greek and Latin, and the um, bare uh, syllable count per line that you'll find in French poetry. So in order to talk about the structure of a line of verse, you have to learn a little bit of Greek first. You use two words to describe the meter of a line. The first word tells you what kind of feet the line is made up of, and the second word tells you how many feet are in the line. A foot is a group of syllables where some are stressed and some are unstressed. Shakespeare is most famous for writing in iambic pentameter, which is a line with five iams in it, and an iam is a pair of syllables that go unstressed, stressed. For example, but soft, what light, through yawn, der wind, do breaks, or a horse, a horse, my king, dumb four, a horse. But Shakespeare also sometimes uses other types of feet. The ones to look out for are spondies, which are stressed, stressed. You normally don't have an entire line made up of spondies. You'll have just one spondy in a sea of iams, generally. Um, you can also find a trochee, which is the opposite of an iamb. It goes stressed, unstressed. Or a dactyl, which is three syllables, where the first one is stressed and the second two are unstressed. The adjectives for these forms are spondaic, trochaic, and dactylic. Then addressing the second word, it's just the number in Greek for however many syllables there are, and then the word meter. So dimeter would have two feet in a line, then you've got trimeter, tetrameter, pentameter, uh, hexameter, heptameter, octameter? You're probably not gonna go much higher than hexameter. One more foreign word, this time it's Latin, and it is, I believe, pronounced sejura but I learned how to scan poetry from a Greek woman, so I always want to say kaisura. Shout out to Professor Panusi. A sejura is a pause within a line. So since iambic pentameter is quite a lot of syllables, you'll generally find a natural break somewhere in the line, sometimes marked with a comma or a question mark or a semicolon. Okay, now that you all know how to speak in dactylic trimeter, if you so wish, let us move on to how Shakespeare uses meter in his writing. The majority of Shakespeare's work is in a specific type of iambic pentameter, which is called blank verse, which is iambic pentameter where you do not rhyme. This is the normal default way that Shakespearean characters are talking. So if they um, diverge from this, then you should pay attention and try to figure out why they're doing that. If blank verse is unrhymed iambic pentameter, you can, of course, have couplets, which is rhymed iambic pentameter with the rhyme scheme A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. Characters often use couplets when they're talking about some weighty question of ethics or some such. Um, couplets also stick better in the brain, so Shakespeare will sometimes call attention to a line by having it rhyme. Shakespeare likes to use couplets to close out a scene so that you have something to mull over while one set of characters exit and the new set enter. Um, an example of this would be, oh cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. So if couplets elevate a scheme, dropping the rhyme scheme de-elevates a scene. Shakespeare has his more unrefined characters speaking in prose rather than in verse. Examples include um, Sir John Falstaff in the Henry IV plays and the, um, the actors or the common artisans um, of Athens in A Midsummer Night's Dream. And then within iambic pentameter, you can sometimes get a little bit creative. The most famous example is quite possibly the most famous line in the English language, and that is to be or not to be, that is the question. Let's count the meter on that one real quick. To be or not to be, that is the question. You have an extra half foot. Having an unstressed syllable at the end of a line of iambic pentameter means it has a feminine ending or a weak ending 
Women did not invent the terminology that describes poetry. Characters will use feminine endings when they are not confident of their position. You'll sometimes also find what I like to call bad iambic pentameter, which is mostly iambic pentameter, but some of the iams are replaced with dactyls or trochees or spondees. Shakespeare will sometimes do this to highlight a specific word or a specific verbal relationship within a line, but if you have a speech with a lot of mix up of um, different types of feet within it, you're probably looking at a very emotional character who can't um, stay within the rational ordered rhythm of iambic pentameter. If you want to compare the different metrical styles, read the first three scenes of Henry IV Part One. In the first scene you'll see King Henry who is the establishment and he's speaking in perfect iambic pentameter. In the second scene you'll see Prince Hal, his dissipated son, who's hanging out with like peasants in taverns and he's speaking in prose. And in the third scene you'll see Hotspur who is coming with a complaint against the king and at first he starts speaking in pretty good iambic pentameter but as he gets more and more angry angry, he uh, loses his ability to control the meter. And the final major use of meter in Shakespeare that I want to talk about today is trochaic tetrameter. One of the reasons Shakespeare uses iambic pentameter so much is that it sounds like natural English speech and it's easy to fit your words in a play to that sort of meter. And when you go to see a production of Shakespeare, you often won't really notice when people are speaking in iambic pentameter because it just sounds normal. Shakespeare uses trochaic tetrameter when he wants to call attention to the fact that something is poetry. So for example, you have the witch's incantation in Macbeth. It goes, Double, double, toil and trouble. You'll also find trochaic tetrameter in the messages that are left inside the caskets that Portia's suitors open in The Merchant of Venice. One of the lines there is, all that glitters is not gold. Slight variation there ending on the stressed syllable rather than an unstressed syllable. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope you will keep this in mind when you are reading Othello, and I will come back probably next week to talk to you about that play. Have fun!